So, gang, I got to share this with you. I'm 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 calling Brad this morning because I've been getting these series of. I don't know how you would describe them. Emotionally manipulative emails, Brad. Yeah, from, I think that's a fair way to put it. From a listener. And this happens every once in a while that someone, <laughs> uh, I guess the lack of a better phrase is to say they put the onus of their success or failure on Brad and I, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons why I like podcasting, but I don't necessarily like teaching is that <laughs> it's it's kind of like it's kind of like that idea that I like humans in the concept, but sometimes as individuals, I'm like, ugh, I can't take it. So yeah. anyway, uh, I'm asking for Brad, like, hey, what's the best way to respond to this email? Because it's very emotionally manipulative and they're yes. trying, they're clearly trying to get me to tell them that they're great and I, all, all yeah. the future is opening up for them if they just work hard and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But Platitudes. I'm feeling manipulated by the whole email. So I say, Brad, how do I respond to this? And Brad says, <laughs> well, at first I said, you don't owe this guy a response at all. I would not respond in the slightest. I would just let it filter to the bottom of the tank. But uh, but if you really had, if you felt you it was necessary to send this person a response, I would just send him an emoji of a thumbs up. <laughs> just, just, just a thumbs up emoji. Like, I wouldn't even take the time out to write a word. I would just give him thumbs up emoji. And Dave goes, well, why Why is that? Why, why the thumbs up? <laughs> I said <laughs> that I was reading that too long ago, that if somebody like cuts you off in traffic and you, your first impulse is to give them the middle finger, it actually hurts their feelings a lot more if you just give them a thumbs down. <laughs> is there something psychologically that's more, more upsetting about getting a thumbs down? Because a, a middle finger is aggressive and it makes you the bad guy. <laughs> the thumbs down is like you've passed judgment on this person and they just haven't measured up and it's a thumbs down. And so I said, I've been using the wrong finger all this time. <laughs> and so I am absolutely delighted by this response and I'll tell you why. Because Brad Geiger, who I know is one of the most sweet and delightful and genteel laughers in life, you get him behind the wheel and it's like Jekyll and Hyde, right? He's such an angry driver. And the fact that Brad on his own casual side reading time is doing research on new and better ways to insult other drivers is killing me. Like Brad's like, oh, I'm gonna note that down. Let's see, okay, I'm gonna write that down. All right, thumbs down for a driver, not the middle finger. And so I'm imagining Brad like at the kitchen table that night with the family, like clinking his glass. Hey, family, family, ding, ding, ding. Quick family update, pass the mashed potatoes, please. Uh, father is not going to be giving anyone the middle finger every, I was reading on Reddit today that the thumbs down is actually a more effective method for, for letting someone know you're angst. Well, I've got I've got to stop you right there because you're making it sound like I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an aggressive driver, and I don't think I don't think anything could be further from the truth. The last time we drove together, I know that I was a little frightened mouse behind the wheel because I was driving that big Tacoma, bigger than anything I've ever driven before, and I was scared out of my wits. So I know the last time that we drove together, I was a gentle little mouse. I, a gentle little mouse. I know two dead possums that would say otherwise. <laughs> well, they had it coming. <laughs> listen, listen. But, uh, actually, you uh, you got to try to hit. I'm, I'm being serious now. Because if you swerve to avoid something like that, you can actually do more damage. So something like that comes out on the road, you hit them square. Yeah, yeah exactly. I got to yeah. tell you guys, by the way, it is, it is truly seeing a slice of Americana to see Brad in a large 4x4 in the American West just arm out the window giving people thumbs down left and right. It was the greatest way. It was the greatest way to do it. Uh, So I highly recommend renting a car with Brad Geiger. Yeah, I I tell you what, my next thumbs down is we pointed at the passenger seat. (laughs) And on that note, I'm going to say hello everybody and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about giving you a thumbs up on life and making comics. <laughs> and giving a thumbs up to making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of the comics documentary Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave. 
Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. We have an exciting show. We have we just went over the topics for today's show, and I am super excited for this one. But before we jump into it, I just want to let you know about our sponsor uh, for this week's show. Comic Lab is brought to you this week by the book How Comics Were Made, a visual history from the drawing board to the printed page. This is from comics historian and Comic Lab fan Glenn Fleischman, who has spent years researching the history of a comic strip production and reproduction and is bringing his expertise to this printed work full of comics from Yellow Kid through Crazy Cat, Doonesbury, Peanuts, and yes, even Dave Kellett's own drive. I'm going to say Aww. the shining part of the book, probably. I'm, gonna say, I'm just going to say that without, without having read it yet. Uh, it will feature never-before-seen original drawings and printing artifacts such as Flongs, the hilarious old-fashioned name for printing molds. The book draws from the museum collections from the Billy Ireland Library and the Charles M. Schultz Library, generous access to the artist's own archives and Glenn's personal collection, Glenn's taking the book to crowdfunding in February. So using lessons drawing from this very podcast, he's going to be uh, bringing this to uh, crowdfunding this February. You can read more about the book or sign up to get an alert when the campaign launches by going to howcomicswermade.inc. Yes, that's ink as in what we draw with I-N-K, howcomicswermade.inc. Dot ink. And I will give you a personal validation and thumbs up. Glenn's work is always exceptional. Uh, he is a polymath. He writes with such passion and energy and is a huge comics fan and historian and has been diving deep. I know this from personal experience in the last few years in the history of this part of comics, and I cannot recommend this enough. Absolutely. Looking forward to that coming up in February. So, Dave, we've got a question here. I actually know we've got a topic that I, I, I should uh, introduce. We, we've seen a lot of people asking uh, publicly, is it possible to make a living in comics? And you had a lot of thoughts on that that I am very anxious to hear about uh, because it's another one of those existential questions about what we're actually doing here and, and, and specifically what we're doing on this show. So let me ask you, is it possible to make a living from comics? Well, yes. And one of the reasons why I think this is worth talking about is because sometimes um, people tend to broadcast an Eeyore reaction towards mm -hmm. a career in comics. And for those not familiar with Eeyore, he's the sort of, is he a donkey? I know that I'm he's a donkey. He's a donkey. Yes. Yeah. He always sort of has the, well, nothing's going right. It's very <laughs> much, you know, oh, I'm Eeyore. Blah, blah, blah. And so part of being able to see and envision your future in comics, I think, is knowing that a certain thing is possible. Right. You literally have to see it if you want to be it, you know? And so for mm -hmm. me, going for a career in independent comics, I cannot say enough good things about Jeff Smith because his career to me was a role model that I didn't have to go with publishers. I could own and control my own career and find success, which was a key part of it for me. That it's not just like, you know, I'm going to be Emily Dickinson writing in a, my, my house by myself and no one will ever see it in my lifetime. I wanted yeah. like Jeff Smith to be able to own it and control it, but also have success, get it out in front of people. And so part of what I want to talk about today is that not only is it possible to make a career in comics, there are people who are making bonkers careers in comics. And yeah. so I want to share this with you, not in any way to knock you down about what you are making, have made, will make in comics. That's not at all what this is. This yeah. is just to counteract the narrative that comics can't provide a living and in some rare cases can't provide a tremendous living. Um, yeah. It is a career that can make money. And so I see some cartoonist broadcasting that um, in a very Ziggy or Eeyore way of like, you know, comics, we all know comics will never pay. Yeah. And I want to yeah. tell you, comics can pay. And I want to kind of go through a list. I'm not going to give you names and I'm not going to yeah. give you exact salaries because uh, that's uh, why out someone like that. But this right. grew out of a conversation with another cartoonist friend of ours who was saying like, I mean, well, no one's making money in comics. And I literally started to list out names and, <laughs> and, and very, what I would consider very solid guesses as to their income. Yeah. And they educated, were like, oh. educated estimates. Yeah. Based on my own income, based on their Kickstarters, based on their Patreons. Yep. And, uh, based on their publishing history. And uh, I was listing them out and explaining why I got to certain numbers. And I will just say, so that you understand these numbers that I'm about to give you. The other artist was like, oh yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, yep, yep, they're making that. Oh yeah, those six people are making that. Yep, those dozen people yep. are making that. Yep, that's right. Yeah. And so these are not unfounded, pulled out of the air numbers. These are 
people that I'm very familiar with uh, that are, and these are very educated guesses as to what they're making. Wouldn't you say, Brad? Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, absolutely. And in other words, you can take a look not only like at a Kickstarter. Uh, it was sometimes we let's take Kickstarter just for an example. We get kind of mystified by Kickstarter numbers because we see a Kickstarter with a real high number. And it's like, oh, that person must be making a whole lot of money. Right. Right. Until you take a look at the page count on the book and the stretch goals. Did they overdo it with stretch goals? Right. Are they right. are they overproducing for in other words, how much of that money? is being put into the 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 comic uh producing process and the merchandise producing process and how much of that is a left over as a profit for the kickstarter that you can keep or b going to be able to make and and i've said this for a long time the kickstarter is not just about getting books into the hands of the kickstarter backers the kickstarter even more than that should be about building enough and, and pr producing enough of that merchandise right. so that after you fulfilled that Kickstarter, there's a whole lot left over for you to sell and to put into distribution, right. sell at retail. Right. So knowing that as we do, we can look at a, at a Kickstarter as somebody's done and said, okay, that was a high number, but they're not actually probably, you know, they, they probably, once the Kickstarter was done, they probably didn't have anything left to show for it, either in money or in stock. Right. So right. that's how, that's kind of what I'm talking about. When, when I say that Dave is making educated uh, estimates here is that he can take a look at somebody's uh, a career, their, their Kickstarter, any deals that they've signed. He's got enough backstory to kind of guess where they fit on, on like an annual income scale. Right. And again, this I'm not about to share any of this with you so that you feel bad about your career. I'm right. sharing this so that you see that there is a goal to shoot for or that there yes. is a ceiling that might be higher than you think. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you why. In my 20s, no one talked about this. <laughs> you had to you had to beg, borrow and steal to get anyone to give you even the vaguest idea of what they were making. And you mm -hmm. had no idea if it was possible to have a, 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 a you know, a, a poverty income, a middle income a high income you had right. no sense of it you knew jim davis was making money but you had no yeah. idea what anybody else was making right and so uh i want to talk about that today and i also it's a little bit a counter narrative to the polls that happen brad sometimes mm -hmm. when people say hey let's do an anonymous poll online <laughs> and you tell us <laughs> what you've made <laughs> oh well yeah I, I i don't know about you dave i see these polls happen from time to time there was one a year maybe a year and a half ago that was like, hey, just tell us privately what you're making as an income from your comic. And as somebody who really believes in the in the in the comics community, specifically independent comics making, I immediately clicked the link and got ready to put my number in there, hovered my mouse over it. Immediately, I thought, what are you doing? Right. Why do you want to participate in this? Uh, I didn't trust that my number would actually be private because I'm a little bit of a tinfoil hat guy, I right. guess. Uh, but but I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm not participating in this. Yeah. And I called Dave and I go, did you see that poll? Dave goes, yeah. I said, are you going to participate? He says, are you kidding me? I'm not going to yeah. put my number into that form. Meanwhile, everybody, his brother who makes a buck 98 a year on their comic was flooding to that uh to that form right. so they could put in their buck 98 the results from that poll were uh, very predictably skewed but but at the same time it's like well it, 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 that sends out the message that it's impossible to make money doing comics right. when really people who are doing this as a living Let's face it. I love you guys. I love I love you so much. I show up to, and do this show week in and week out because I love you. I ain't telling you my numbers. Yeah, I'm not telling you my numbers. There's a lot of things I'll tell you. I tell you a lot of stuff I shouldn't tell you. I'm not telling you my numbers. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it, it, because my number might sound very impressive to me. And then you might hear, well... I thought it would be about twice as much as that. Right. Or I'll tell you my number and you're like, there's no way that guy is worth that much. That's twice as much as I thought that he should right. be making. Right. There, there's a there's a no win situation to me sharing my numbers with you. Uh, but uh, the, this 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 uh, endeavor that Dave's going to do where he's going to tell you educated guesses and so forth. I think that has value because 
it does show you, like Dave says, that it's, this is not a hopeless thing that we're talking about. This, if, if, if you're doing comics right now and you're not making money, it, 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 and you're doing, again, all those things we talk about, high quality, blah, blah. You're getting a response on social media. You might be somebody who's doing really great on Reddit. And you don't understand, how do I make a money uh, doing a comic, right? Maybe you Because it doesn't add up. It means that you've got to look elsewhere for your answers than just, uh, you know, uh, putting your palms to the ceiling and say, well, I don't know, web comics, right? Like walk, this, yep. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so Dave, just, just off the top of your head, what does your list look like? Well, before I dive, dive into it, I know this is a lot of run up to the actual list, but it's fun. I forgot actually that part of my impetus in doing this was a cartoonist on Reddit saying, Oh, I'm, <sighs> I'm, I have gangbuster numbers. Why am I not making a living or why am I not doing yeah. better? Yeah. And the problem, the answer, the answer to that is not, well, what's web comics can't make any money. Wink, wonk, yeah. bump, 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 bump. The yeah. answer is you got to change what you're doing in terms of looking at how your outreach is going. What's the overall audience that you're talking what to? What you're doing on Patreon. How are you monetizing them? What is, what are you using to monetize them? What's the core of your comic? Is that monetizable? Right. And so, uh, uh, there's a lot of uncomfortable questions that are behind that, that no one, the true pros did not want to come out of the woodwork and answer that person because no. why, what's the benefit to me to answering that person no about, uh, about no why that's not working out for them. So anyway, let's go through it. So uh, this came out of a conversation, as I said, with another professional cartoonist who was saying, geez, nobody's making no money from comics. So I want to give you some big, bold brass tacks. So yeah. uh, making a hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollars a year. This is the baseline of where we're starting, and then I'm going to go up and go to talk about bigger ones. I right. know of and can create a list of about four dozen cartoonists that are making somewhere between a hundred and three hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, what are they doing? They all have a Patreon. They're all kickstarting. Mm -hmm. A few of them have taken their Kickstarter books and sold them on to publishers. They're right. making a few convention appearances. They're offering uh, uh, original art here or there. They're offering yeah. merch. They're for the most part owning and controlling their own career, right? Mm -hmm. And they are taking an active role in monetizing their comic. They're not handing it off to someone, right? Right. So anyway, 48 or so people uh, in that list, $100,000 to $300,000. Uh, above $500,000, or no, I, the next list I would say is close to, but maybe not making $500,000 a year, half a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. I can think of, and Brad maybe could expand or minimize this list, eight to 15 folks making yep. close to, but not going over a half million dollars a year in comics or web comics. Yep. Um, and then, and I'm Brad and I are looking at the list right now because I have them typed out and I, every one yeah. of these names, I could be like, yep, 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 yep. They're all making yeah. uh, uh, close to, but not over $500,000. And then over a half million dollars, half million dollars plus, uh, some of them look significantly over half a million dollars. I can think of a half dozen folks and I have the list in front of me. Brad's looking at it as well. Mm -hmm. are published or, or sorry are making over a half million dollars a year from a common and some of these by the way are published i will be honest about that some of these yeah. have taken their success in web comics yeah. and brought it to publishing that's fine uh but i i just want you to know that that path has brought them a half more than a half million dollars in comics um some of right. them i'm uh, two or three brad if you're looking at this list with me i'm guessing are closer to a couple million on yeah. that list yeah and so again I don't mention it. And, and by the way, none of this is uh, that none of this includes syndicated cartoonists of which I think Brad and I could say there's probably still a dozen that are making some serious cash. Uh, mm -hmm, Davis, mm -hmm. Baby Blues, this and that. Like you could go down sure. the list and say, all right, there's still a, a, a good chunk of folks that are making serious cash, even amongst the death of newspapers. None mm -hmm. of this list is including Marvel or DC, of which I'll be honest, I've never really known people that have made bank. There are, there are yeah. people that are making a good income buying a house, but... Mm -hmm. When their career ends at DC and Marvel, and it always does, yeah, they don't necessarily have a huge replacement income. So, yes, right. you can make a good, uh, wonderful middle class life in Marvel or DC, and there's a few superstars, but not a lot. Uh, but I do, I will say, there's a few more in publishing that are not on this list that are also making banks. So that's yeah. And I'll also throw in this is, is that where I'm very confident in your educated guesses in those names I saw on the list. You and I, neither one of us are as familiar with comics, especially big two comics True. And, and how True. those how those careers go other than what we see. Very good. Point. So 
So it's it's fair to assume that there might be a couple people that are that are making serious bank in the same way that syndicated cartoonists are. So we'll we'll open the door for that. And I'll also say this: it's something that you we you and I have talked about for a long time. As much as we'd love to think that we've got this uh, uh, this very all seeing eye in the world of comics yep. every year, especially around award season. Yes. Right. All of a sudden we see all these names that we've never heard of who are doing amazing work. So of all the people on your list that you, those are all the people that you yourself know about. Think about all of the people that you've never heard of <laughs> that also belong on that list. You just aren't personally directly familiar with yeah, absolutely and that's why i want to say this is not even uh all inclusive this is just ones that yeah. i could think of in this conversation with this third cartoonist when brad and i were mm -hmm. on the phone with them and so um every couple of years as brad said around award times i say who is this person yeah. i look them up and then i'm like wait they have a studio of two assistants how much are they yes. making that kind of thing like yes. you immediately go all right well they're clearly making a good income but also mm -hmm. i will say this about the big two comics because i also want to heavily underline with brad that's not our core expertise that's not the mm -hmm. world we walk in i will say to me as far as educated guesses it was very very telling to me how many of them were willing to very quickly walk away from the big two when Substack was saying, here's six figures. Not yeah. a lot of six figures. Yes. It's just bare yes. bones. We've cleared six figures. We're going to offer you that to come away from the big two and go come work on Substack. There was a good yeah. half dozen big names that I was like, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. They were very quick to jump away from that. Uh, yes. I, I, if, they're, if they're making a quarter million or a half million, they wouldn't have been so quick to jump to that. So that was, that was an interesting <laughs> tell if you think that's about it in fair. a poker sense. You know what I mean? Yes, that's fair. That's an absolute fair thing to say is that they, they the number of people we saw there uh, uh it, clearly they they weren't uh they didn't not need the money right and they weren't right. not quick to jump when it was just a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> offered you know right. right so okay so what does this tell us so uh, here's the so what part of this yes. whole conversation right what does that tell you well it tells you a lot a few things number one if you're looking to build a career in comics, it is possible. It is possible to build a substantial career and a sustainable career. What else does it tell you? You've got to make smart business decisions. Again, you've got to take an interest in your business, a concept that this show has been built around for since we started it in 2018 and every week in between that, we've kind of talked about these issues where you have to take a, 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 a an interest in your business. You've got to make smart business decisions. You can't do a lot of stuff that like the stuff that we talk about uh, on the regular and then just hope that it's going to turn out. So, yes, you've got to be a business person. And yes, I know you don't want to be a business person. Nobody, nobody woke up wanting uh, to be a cartoonist and said, and also I want to be a social media marketer or a, uh, and a, and a merchandise planner and a promotional person that, that nobody, nobody who grew up being in love with comics the way we all did also wanted to be a marketing, right? Uh, but that's the reality of the world we're living in. And there's one extra thing that you've got to understand. You are not owed a career in comics. Nobody is. Nobody is owed this. No one is entitled to this. So if you're somebody who says, well, I want to be a cartoonist. I don't want to I don't want to be involved in the business side of things. That's only OK if you are at the level that you can hand that stuff off to like Raina. I could see Raina saying, hey, I don't want to be involved in marketing. But Raina's career is at the point where she can hand that stuff off. My career is not like that. Dave's career is not like nope. that. And your career listening at home is probably not and like that. And the vast bulk means, of us will not be like that ever. You know. Yes. Yeah. And that means that means we need to learn business. It means we learn to need to learn to make smart business decisions. It means that we need to learn to make social media works. It means that we need to learn to make the thing that comes after social media right. work. Right. It means marketing. It means merchandising. It means a whole lot of stuff that none of us as kids wanted. But this is what the career now entails. So if you want it, get busy. Yes. 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 And that's why none of this, none of this conversation was to make you feel bad, was to make you right. feel hopeless. If anything, Just the opposite. It's, it's, if anything, it's meant to instill hope in that 
Like I said, you need to see it if you want to be it. And part of me wanting to share this with you is, well, there's absolutely people that are making good money in comics and web comics. <laughs> and it, just because you hear someone on Reddit or on Twitter be like, oh, web comics, wink, walk, a dollar and, yeah. a, and a candy bar is what you'll make in web comics. Not necessarily true. You just like Brad said, you got to own it. You got to control it and you got to make your own magic. And you got to work it. I, and, and again, this is I, I'll, I'm just going to double underline that this is not supposed to be bad news for you. In fact, it's good news. And, and I know Dave always chuckles every time I say it. But if you are a creative person, <laughs> if you are someone who can look at nothing and make something, your your brain is working at the highest possible level, yes. in my opinion. Yes. And, 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 and you could argue analytical thought is up there, too. But the, the upper limits of analytical analysis comes into creativity as well. There has to be a, a, a certain level of creativity in there. What I'm saying is if you can look at a blank sheet of paper and come up with, or a blank screen and come up with something there that somebody wants to engage in, you can certainly learn the right way to run your Patreon. Yes. You can certainly learn the right way to run your Kickstarter. You can certainly learn to pay your estimated taxes. You can learn all of this stuff. You don't want to. Nobody, but listen, I, I didn't want to learn the right way to spell every word either. I wanted right. to come up with my own spellings. And, right. and many of my comics <laughs> make a goddamn good attempt at coming up with my own spellings. <laughs> I didn't want to learn spelling or grammar. I had to because I wanted to communicate with people. Yes. Right. Yeah. I wanted to I wanted to write things that people understood what the hell I was talking about. So I had to learn grammar. I had to learn. I didn't want to do any of that yes. stuff. Right. Yes. But I had to. You know why? That's what the job requires. And I'm going to give you a really specific because I'm feeling it right now. This yeah. is how much I hate aspects of my business in that I, it's yeah. not just oh. wine and roses for Dave Kellett. No, I'm currently in tax season, right? And Brad knows this. <laughs> my wonderful bookkeeper of 12 years, bless yeah. her heart, she's currently hospitalized. And so for the first time in 12 years, I'm going to have to issue my company's 1099s to the artists that I hired over the years. Either it yeah. was colorists, it was people doing Tales of the Drive, it was uh, another art that's the, an artist that did some writing for another project that hasn't come out yet. Um, mm. All of which to say, I have to issue about six or seven 1099s. I've never done it before. I'm fucking yeah. dreading tonight having to figure oh. out how to do it because I, I feel know. like I'm going to mess it up. Am I going to figure it out? Yes. Am I a smart person and it's not rocket science? Yes. Yes, but I fucking hate it. I, I yeah. despise certain aspects of my business and taxes once a year, definitely. But here's the thing. Here's the kicker. Because I'm doing this, I'm owning and controlling my own business. I am ensuring yep. that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, I'm still working as a cartoonist because yes. by God, I will figure it out and I will make it happen. And that's what I'm trying to give you to take away from this is that not only is it possible, you can do it. You have to put your head down. You have to own it and control it. You got to make your own magic, but you can do it. And yes, it is possible to make a very good living in comics. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Well, Brad, by way of an update, I actually have a question coming in for that's perfect for you, actually. Um, and this is sort of an update from a previous question and previous topic that we had on a show a week back or two on uh, how to write a short story. And this yeah. comes in over at patreon.com slash comic lab, which everybody is joining. It's a raucous party oh. that everyone's joining because we're getting to 500 patrons and everyone is getting a drunk and drunker comic lab when we get to 500. So just a reminder, patreon.com slash comic lab. You want to get there.
I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think we brought it up last show, but since we started just telling people, hey, we want you as part of our community over on Patreon, uh, we've gotten a lot <laughs> of people join us. People are really interested in helping us get to 500 so we can do those shows. And uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I think we're going to have it by spring at this rate. We are going to be doing Drunk Comic Lab in the nice weather. I, I it, It's going to be, we might, I might even be out on the back porch at that that point, uh, I, 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 it's, I think it's going to happen for us soon because people are really, really joining at uh, at a fantastic rate. So thank you. If you've already joined, thank you. If you're on the fence, this is your uh, opportunity to help us get up to that goal and to get some of the best shows that we've ever done. Our drunk, our drunk shows for some reason <laughs> turn out to be great shows. So, uh, so help us get there. Patreon.com slash comic lab. And so this question comes in from comic lab over on Patreon and it comes in uh, and says, dear bad and rave. That's a new one. Bad and rave. I like that one. That's like our D our morning DJ names, bad and yeah, rave. Bad and uh, rave. Coming so at you. Here's the question. Short form. How do you write a long form comic, Brad? That's the basic yeah. of the question. Here's the the long answer or the long question hear me out i've read and listened to plenty about world building character development and plot progression and about paneling composition and text layout but what does the bit in the middle the process mm -hmm. of actually writing look like mm -hmm. what method do you pros use is there a universal process how much should you script before paneling i want to have someone read over my first few chapters before i start drawing but i want it to be coherent Context, I'm currently drafting an adventure manga for my own enjoyment, not for publishing. I've made notes of important plot points and how the story evolves and the characters develop from one to the other. But seven chapters in, I've realized I've just made up my own process of writing. And here's what they write. Write a script, split the text into a number of pages, break it down into panels, add a description of what I will eventually draw in those panels, and hope that the plan survives putting pencil to paper. So yeah. many thanks from a drizzly London. And this comes in from Steph, by the way. So thank oh. you, Steph, for this answer or this question. Uh, Brad, first of all, I just want to say before I pass it over to you, I think Steph's is a perfectly workable uh, solution on how to write a long form comic. Absolutely. I, I didn't hear a single thing there that bothers me. Uh, but but it's a great topic that I want to talk about because it dovetails really nicely with something that happened in my storytelling class uh, just a week ago, uh, I, I on the first day of class, I give all my students an opportunity to tell me all about themselves so I know who I'm working with. Right. All the, you know, the important stuff, their name, how to pronounce their name properly, their pronouns, all of that stuff. And uh, I give them a chance to kind of tell me a little bit about themselves. This one person writes, I'm glad you asked. Uh, they, they, they said, I've been diagnosed with ADHD. And it's 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 basically making me a bad writer because every time I write, my head jumps ahead to to to, to way ahead of where I'm supposed to be and wants to be up there. I'm, I'm writing chapter one. My head wants to write chapter seven. I, I'm writing the beginning. My head write, wants to write the conclusion. Right. And I, and, they, and this person said it's 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 really keeping me back from being a good writer. And so. I'm not saying that Steph has ADHD, by the way, but I am saying that the answer to both of these things are very, very similar. And it comes down to, I actually found a William Faulkner quote that uh, addresses this <laughs> way better than I could. So I'm going to quote Faulkner, quote, let the writer take up surgery or bricklaying if they are interested in technique. There is no mechanical way to get the writing done. No shortcut. The young writer would be a fool to follow a theory. Teach yourself by making your own mistakes. People learn only by error, unquote. Uh, that's Faulkner talking about the creative process. And my advice to you is much the same, right? Uh, in other words, the question is, what is the system that the pros use? There is no universal system. We're talking about creativity, not uh, and not not uh, cabinet making. Right. Right. This is something that is as personal and unique to you as a person, as your own brain. And as I told uh, uh, my, my my class Monday, without directing it towards any one person, I said, your brain is your, your creative process. And if your brain wants to hop ahead, then hop ahead. Yeah. That's yeah. how your brain is yes. working. Think about it. You're, uh, why would you fight your own brain? You can't. 
right? right. And, and, and this whole, I should be doing it. I said, writers, beginning writers think that we write in alphabetical order, A, B, C, D, E, right? The introduction and then the middle and then the conclusion. One, two, three, we write it all in order. Well, writing seldom happens like that. You, you talk to people who write humor. They say a lot of times they write the punchline first and then write the setup, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We, we don't write in an orderly fashion. None of us do. And what you need to do, what, what my student needs to do, what Steph needs to do, what I need to remind myself, uh, what we all need to do is to work with our own brain to find our own solutions that work. Steph's going to find their own way. Steph's yep. going to figure out what works for Steph and it's going to be brilliant. If I tried to do it that way, I'd probably fail. You know why? Got a different brain rattling around in my skull yep, than yep, Steph yep. does. So Steph... The way you are doing it is perfect. And the way I know it is, is because of this. It's the way that you do it. And if I tried to do, tell you to do it the way I do it, it would be the biggest mistake in the world and lead you down a terrible path because uh, it works for my brain. It ain't going to work for yours. So what you've got to do, uh, kind of the same answer as in the first segment of the show, you've got to make your own solutions. You've got to take this on. It's kind of the same thing. You've got to figure out what works for you and, 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 and not get too wrapped up. There's some people and we talk about it all the time. There, there's, there's some, some good archetypes you can follow. There's some good methods you can follow. Right. There's some things that might lead you to a, in a right direction. And all of those things are good and valid. And that's why we share them. But at the end of the day, you have to find, figure out how Steph rights. And, th and that's the only thing that's ever going to matter is you finding a process that works for you. Yeah. And that's why that Faulkner quote is so good, because yeah, unlike bricklaying, which has two, three, four possibilities of how you lay a brick down, um, writing can be nigh infinite. And only in the process of doing, as Faulkner was saying, do mm -hmm. you come to figure out what works for you. And I will say, Steph, in a way that may make you feel better, so I've been writing Drive since, was it 2009? So what is that, 15 yeah. years now? 15 years now. And um, I too will have sections of story that are not going to happen for years from now, but are demanding at the back of my brain. Like, hey, pay attention to me. No, write this down. Hey, work yeah. on this right now. And it's like, no, I want, I look at it, I'm on Act 4. I can't write Act 6 yet. I've got to write Act yeah. 4. And uh, in in the weird semi mystical process of creativity, my brain is like, no, we're on this section right now. Write this down. And who knows? Maybe I'm an undiagnosed ADHD. I uh, but uh, I think it's just the matter of your brain, my brain, sometimes all of our brains have been working on a chunk of the story quietly in the background mm -hmm. while we're asleep, while we're on the tube, while we're while we're taking the bus somewhere, while we're shopping for groceries, and somehow it has put together pieces and it's like, listen to me, I'm, yeah, I'm ready to work this out, now. put this down on paper. Yeah. And it's not always perfect. I'll, I'll write it down and be like, oh, well, that didn't end up being as good as I thought, but it's there mm -hmm. for when I, ha when I go to the future. And what's nice is I have something to work off of. Um, so I will say that might not be as unique to you as you think it is. Uh, Brad, does that happen to you where suddenly the story will clamor for you to write something that you're not going to yeah. get to for three years from now? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you've got to put it down on paper, but it, it, the biggest mistake I made was thinking, well, I can't work on that now because I, I can't work on a part seven. I got to work on part two. That's yes. what I got to get yeah. done now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then later on, I finally get all the way up to part seven and I go, I knew I had something for this. <laughs> yes, yes, it's true. <laughs> you know, so so sometimes, and like I said, you got to stop fighting yourself. Your your brain kind of knows what it's doing, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and you got to trust that you know, we we think that there, that there's one way to do this, where there's just one way to think, there's just one way to be creative, and we think that our way clearly can't be very good. When really there's nothing of the of the sort. And what you really have to do is figure out how you do this well instead of how to do it well. Right. And uh, writing is a little bit like distributing ice cream to six kids. And here's what I mean by that. Have you ever had it where like you're you're doing it. Everybody's getting two scoops. So they're getting a spoon. Yep. They're getting their bowl and you're passing out the ice cream to six kids. But the three year olds like, what about me? What about me? What about me? Yep. What about me? Yep. What about me? Yep. What about me? They're, and so like <laughs> you just like shine it. I, I can't get anything else done until I take care of the three year old. Yeah. In a way, that chapter that's way ahead, that's begging you to write it. 
Until you get it done, you're not going to be able to, tr- it'll, it'll still be at the back of your brain going, what about me? What about me? What about me? What about yeah. me? What about me? What about me? And so sometimes just getting it out, getting it on the page, then you can say, look, I worked on it. That's done. Now I'm going to go back to the chapter that I actually need to work on. But until you get it out, it's that yeah. three-year-old screaming for ice cream at you, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you got to, you got to handle that. You yeah. got to do yeah. that. And it's, it's actually much better to do that. Yeah. And so I will say though, there's a couple ways if, if you're finding, and this might be the, the question behind your question, if you're finding that your system is not working for you, my sense is you're act, you're asking this question because it is kind of working for you, but you, you just want to check in and say like, hey, am I doing yeah. it right? In yeah. which case, Brad and I will both co-sign. You're doing it right. It's working for you. Keep going. And you'll get better at the process that you're starting to establish and, and go with God. But if your question is, if the question behind the question is, hey, what are the possibilities for doing this? I'll give you a couple different ways from a couple different writers that I've known over, over my time and mm-hmm. how they do it. My wife, when she's writing something, she always puts down what she calls a craptastic draft. She just spits out something. She's just got to get something out. And so right. she writes through, she doesn't edit. She doesn't look back at what she wrote. She just head down, writes the whole thing, right? No notes, no outline, no nothing, just writes the whole thing. Because for her, it's something... Uh, it helps to have something to work off of. Even if it's a negative, you say like, well, Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. So I'm glad I wrote that because that's absolutely what I don't want to do. Right. But there's no outlining for her for the most part. But then I know other writers who like you, Steph, and I think like Brad, uh, Mm. outline the whole thing. And then from outlining, they break it down into page counts. They break the page counts down into individual pages. They break down the individual pages into panels. That's also super valid. Right. And then there's a third way that I use with drive, which is, I've talked about this before, like it's sort of a roadmap. Like I know I have to drive from Los Angeles to New York and on my way to New York, I have to stop at Phoenix. I have to stop Mm -hmm. at Des Moines. I have to stop at Chicago and then on Pittsburgh and then on to New York. Right. So I know the major points that I have to get, but I leave it to future Dave to decide what gas station or restaurant I'm stopping at Mm -hmm. at that road trip six weeks from now. Like that's that's a problem for future Dave. So I don't necessarily outline everything, but I outline the major points for myself so that I know road stops that I have to, definite road stops that I have to make on the way to New York. Um, And that's just sort of a visual metaphor to help you figure out how I do it. But don't you think, Brad, are those, those are three methods that I would see. The craptastic version, the heavily outlined version, and then the sort of middle way, which is outline the major points for yourself, but leave it fluid and flexible. Uh, I think those are the three options, basically, with the long form. Absolutely. And and I'm sure there's more of that, like in the heat of the moment that we're not thinking. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. but, But I, and the important thing is that you've got to find your own way. You've got to find what works for you. And that, and by the way, that means uh, failing a few times. That's the only yeah. thing that we really learn from is failure. So it means that you try it one way and it's like, oh gosh, I, I completely screwed this up, right? And then uh, take that information to the next project and so on and so forth. That's why, I mean, I, I know you're work writing a big long form thing and you're kind of trying to take the curse off it by saying it's not for publication. It's just for yourself. That's all well and good. I would still just being the person I am, I would still try very hard to get you to write a couple of short stories yes. first, just <laughs> because I know the value of that. And I've seen this thing. Thing happen a million times where and we've heard it so from so many people who try to write this big epic and they 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 get lost in the weeds and 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 sometimes get frustrated and leave this whole creative pursuit altogether right because 40 they're pages so in. frustrated yeah, exactly yeah yeah and so I'm still going to, you're not going to listen to me, but I'm, st- I'm still going <laughs> to say it, that you should write a couple of short stories first. And if you want to go back to that short story challenge that I talked about a couple episodes ago, it's a great place to start. I'm telling you, uh, I, 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 I go back and, and, and listen to that show that we, we uh, said how to write a short story. Right. It has an excellent methodology for you to follow just to get your feet wet, just as to get you to write something complete that you can use to find uh, uh, where uh, you need to improve your writing and so forth. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, you're going to do what you're going to do. It's kind of the theme of this segment. And, and par- a part of it is you should do what you're going to do. And I will say three other things uh, in regards to writing a long form story is that Uh, The method that you establish now, much like Faulkner advises, 
mm-hmm. will change and improve yeah. and alter as time goes on. The way that I write now, and I'm going to speak for Brad, the way that he writes now is not the way he wrote 10 years ago. And it's probably better for him in the way that my strategy is better for me and yours will improve with time, which is why Brad's advising the short story. So number one is it's going to change over time. Number two is there are going to be moments in your writing for a long form story where you're like, I know this story. I know these characters. Why can I not write this page or this next act? Part of, as Brad said, those moments come from a lack of confidence. But I will also add this. Sometimes your brain still needs to work out some problem about this stage of a story. And it's telling you by uh, the frustrating inaction that you're experiencing in your writing that that yet that hasn't yet been worked out. You know what I mean? That yeah. that plot line, that character arc, that story point, it hasn't been worked out yet. And so sometimes it's just a matter of time to get past that log jam. And then I also want to say mm-hmm. the flip side of that is sometimes and this happens to all of us. Sometimes we enter into this flow state where suddenly 20 pages are flowing out of us, you know, and it it feels like a kiss from the divine. You know, Mm -hmm. like the Greeks used to talk about this in terms of writing in that sometimes you enter this state that's like the platonic ideal of writing. It is it's almost like you're a vessel. You're just there for it. It's writing itself. Right. That's because in those moments, your brain has worked out all the problems and it's ready for you to write it. And so my one advice for those states, when the flow state happens and someone calls you to dinner or you've got to go do some errand Mm -hmm. maybe leave it for a minute and just give yourself 20 more minutes of writing because when those states happen you got to capitalize them uh uh, there uh, most of the time i I, it happens midday for me and i'm i'm there for it but every once in a while in my life the flow state will happen when other bits of life are calling i'm like i just need 20 more minutes i need 20 more minutes i got i got this you know and so capitalize on them when they come i just got to write it out yeah, you can see where 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 they came up with the uh, idea of muses, people that put yes. ideas in your head because yes. that's really what it feels like sometimes. And when and and when that happens, it's great. Uh, <laughs> and those those moments are few and far between, yes, unfortunately. Yes. But uh, but yeah, I think I think that's something that is definitely worth talking about. So, Dave, we've got another question from a Patreon backer, and this one is in, is a little bit more nuts and bolts. This comes in from Cosmo, who says, "What size and DPI do you recommend for posting on your personal website?" of a comic you may print in the future so the quality holds in different mediums. So what Cosmo is saying is what you're posting something to your website. How do you post it in size and DPI so that it's going to be good enough for print later on? Well, I will I'm I'm probably going to end up deferring this to my friend Brad Geiger who technically is just far better at the description and the use of uh, file preparation that I am given his his decades in newspaper world and in print. But I will say this, your your basic guidepost here is always draw bigger. You can always get smaller, <laughs> but but bigger is better. So size wise, I tend to draw one and a half to two times physically larger than the comic is going to be reproduced in print. My resolution tends to be of of some sort of increment higher than 300 dpi which is how i'm going to print it Mm -hmm. um and so it's either 400 dpi 600 dpi differing files depending on what i'm doing and how i know or don't know how well ever you're going to use it um but that's my guidepost is that it's always bigger because you can always reduce you can always have photoshop shrink it down and and there's a couple different mathematical techniques that it can use to shrink something down you really can't, although AI is getting better, you really can't go bigger. But Brad is about to give us all a better answer, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Cosmo, you're missing something that's really, really important. Your question is, how do I post something on the web that's going to be okay to print? And the answer is, you don't. In fact, you're making a huge mistake if you're trying to do this. There should be, in my estimation, three files for every comic that you do. Okay. Okay. So follow me on this. If you're a digital artist, definitely three. If you're analog, you could argue two, but uh, catch the headline here. Three files for every comic that you do. Number one is a master file. That is at high res. And for me, that means 600 DPI or higher when I'm doing the line art, at least. And it's going to have full layers, all my layers. So if at any time, if I need to go back into that, 
I've got it right. And in a lot of times, this <laughs> and a is lot my... of times it's five minutes after you posted it, right? Oh my God. Yes. Oh, it happens every time, every time, every, every time. time I post something and immediately I get a response on Patreon yep. and I'm like, Oh, I cannot, my, I, I, I get my little dance going. I'm like, Oh, I can't wait. They love what I did. I open it up. Now nah, you got a spelling error. Ah, God damn it. Uh, so yeah. I, I, so first is your high res, uh, original master file. And that might be the, the original high res scan. That might be your, your clip studio or your Photoshop document that you started drawing on. That's your master file. Number one. Now you've got the finished art. Now you're going to have your second file yep. and that's going to be, you're going to crunch down the layers. You can flatten the image and it's going to be CMYK. If you're planning on uh, uh, doing any kind of serious offset printing, and it's still going to be high res. My file uh, uh, for this is going to probably be 400 DPI. The 300 DPI is the lowest you can safely print offset with. I put 400 DPI in there just so I've got a little extra Shush. wiggle room. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. yeah, a little extra insurance. It's, it's, and especially with computers Me today, yep. I'm not worried about backing up. So my second file is going to be, it's going to have all my trapping, all of the uh, image prep so that I can print safely a CMYK file. It's going to have all of that stuff uh, crunched down, flattened, and it's going to be 400 DPI. That's my second file. My third file is going to be for the web. It's going to be, for me, I, I default to 72 DPI, mm -hmm. which I've been, it's, it's because that's been the number for 100 years, right? 72 DPI. It's uh, safe to change it to RGB at this point, because that's also going to give you a little bit of savings. Also, at that point, uh, it's it's RGB is four screens anyway, so it's just a little bit safer right. to go ahead and change it to RGB. Uh, in terms of width, I'm, I'm for anything I'm posting online, anywhere from a thousand pixels wide to maybe sixteen hundred pixels wide. Anything I'm prepping for social media is probably going to be twelve hundred, uh, somewhere between a thousand twelve hundred pixels wide uh, and 72 DPI. Now, in that case, what we're aiming for here is something that gets a nice small file size that's going to upload easily on that person's screen, whether they're uh, looking at it on Twitter or your website or Substack or what have you. You're looking for a nice small file size, right? right? right. So you've got three files. You don't use your print file for the web nope. and for God's sake, you're not going to use your web file for print. You're you're manipulating each one of these files to do what it's meant to do. You can't make one magic file that does everything. You're going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, and that's just three. If, if I'm looking at my own workflow, I've got the original Clip Studio file. I've got the Photoshop file that is uh, resulting after Alex has done the coloring mm -hmm. and the image prep. Then I've got a book ready file. Then I've got a web ready file. Then I've got all of the individual panels ready for the web, right? So I can post on a, on a scroll, either a uh, horizontal or vertical. I've got a lot of files for every single cartoon that I make. And that's because there is no such thing as a one size fits all answer to this. Uh, first of all, I love that my answer was like, draw it big. And Brad's got this 10 minute super detailed answer. And my answer was draw it real big and pretty. Do your best. Hey, make it a real big file. And Brad has this hyper detailed, really accurate and professional answer. Hey, make it really big and pretty. That's the Dave Kellett way. Uh, yeah. Well, listen, I, uh, I I only have one thing to say about <laughs> your answer, <laughs> and that is this: thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my ever delightful and ever informative friend, Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evilcomic.com. 
And my close personal friend Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonists of Sheldon Comics at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And you know what, by the way, Brad, uh, Stripped at the 10-year point now, yeah. and just this week, uh, kind of a, a bittersweet note for me on the personal level, is Fred and I finally dissolved our S-Corp that produced uh, the film 10 years ago. And oh. I'm so happy and proud that that, that company existed and that we made that film. And uh, anyway, just a, a note of passing. Uh, it was how yeah. lovely to have done it. Anyway, I'm going to say the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by the ever wonderful Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. And please keep sending those five-star reviews. You're helping us so much on Apple Podcasts, as well as Spotify, where we're really having great results reaching people. And uh, thank you so much for helping to make that happen. Absolutely. Those things are have been wonderful for the podcast. They're wonderful for Brad and my heart. We cannot tell you how much we appreciate it. And don't forget our sponsor for this week. Uh, this is coming in from Glenn Fleischman, howcomicswermade.inc. That's I-N-K, howcomicswermade.inc. And I will tell you, Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab, where we are racing towards 500 backers for Drunk and Drunker Comic Lab. So I will go ahead and say that twice, patreon.com slash thumbs down. <laughs>